Questions without notice, Senator Mason. Yes. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, uh, Senator Wong. Is the minister aware of reports that the Anglican Church Grammar School in East Brisbane faces an increase in its electricity bill of $70,000 per year, an increase of some 30 per cent as a direct result of the government's carbon tax? Isn't it, isn't it the case that every school in Australia will, like the Anglican, Grammar, Anglican Church Grammar School, face significant increases in running costs as a result of the carbon tax, resulting in either cutbacks in student services, higher fees or other cost to parents, or both? Order. Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, uh, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Well, the answer is no. The answer is no because, as, as the Senator would well know, and it's sort of embarrassing that the only way he can get a question on education is to ask a question on carbon. That's how, that's how much priority those opposite place on education. The only way you can get a question in the portfolio area is to ask a question about carbon pricing. Uh, but as you know, Senator, as you would well know, uh, the Commonwealth funds schools on an indexed basis. The funding is based on the AGSRC average government school recurrent cost amount. That takes into account increases in operating costs and utility costs are included in that index. That's the truth. That's the truth. But of course, what we really want to know, Mr. President, what we really want to know is what the coalition would do when it came to education. Because apparently, according to Mr. Robb, they're going to give it all to Campbell Newman. They're going to give all of education to Campbell Newman. That's the new policy from the coalition. We're going to outsource education and health to the states because we look order, what order, Her Majesty is on his feet. Order, 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 order. On both sides. On both sides. Order. 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 On order on both sides. Senator Brandis. Point of order on the question of direct relevance to the question. The question was about the effect of the carbon tax on the costs to schools. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Campbell Newman. Order. Senator Collins. Order. Thank Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Wong is being directly relevant. She is outlining what the opposition's alternative would be to school funding and how operating costs, which may include any costs associated with running schools, and Senator Brandis understands this well. Senator Mason regrets the fact that he was asked to present this question because he full Order. knows the answer about the AGSRC. Order. There's no point of order. The minister has one minute, uh, 59 seconds. I'm sorry, remaining. The minister, 59 seconds to address the question. Order. In fact, I answer the. Oops. Uh, Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd just like to raise a point of order. Senator Wong continually refers to senators on this side, and particularly Senator Brandis, by the incorrect title. Now, as someone who has been the most precious and uh, outspoken and glass-jawed minister that has ever taken it into this Senate, we shouldn't have to put up with a petty abuse from the most failed and pathetic minister that we've Order. ever seen in this place. Oh. Senator Bernardi. Senator Bart. Order. 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 Senator Ed. Order. Senator Conroy. Senator Evans. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator, w uh, Senator Wong merely, uh, merely seeks to uh, recognise uh, 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 Senator Brandis's position as a member of royalty uh, and the demeanour which he brings associated order. with that, and I'm sure it's meant as a compliment. Order. <laughs> that is not a point of order. I order. I remind honourable senators on both sides that when referring to members of this place or the other, the correct title of the appropriate person must be used on both sides and in both chambers. Order, order, 
The minister has 55 seconds now remaining to answer the question. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, well, well Mr. Sen given Senator Brandis demands that we call the British government Her Majesty's government, I didn't think he'd be offended by the term Her Majesty. But if he does, I certainly won't call him Her Majesty whilst I'm on my feet. Um, but if I can just return to the question, I in fact answered the question. I in fact answered the question in the first in the first 30 seconds or the first 10 seconds, which shows what sort of question it was. Uh, but I am unsurprised that Senator Brandis jumps to his feet to, to, to suggest that it's not relevant what the shadow minister for finance says the opposition will do for education. Uh, we have made very clear or, or, order, when it comes. Order, Senator Wong. Se sen Senator. Br order. Senator Brandis. Respect, you cannot allow this minister to defy your authority as she continually does. Having ruled the last point of order out of order, you now order. you are now entertaining a minister answering a question about the effect of a carbon tax on schools by making a comment on the motives of one senator in taking a point of order on relevance. How can that be relevant to the question she was asked? There's no point of order. I'm listening to order, 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 order. I'm listening to the minister's answer. The minister does have 19 seconds remaining to address the question. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. As I pointed out to the senator in the first uh, 15 seconds, the AGSRC does take into account increases in operating costs, and uh, utility costs are included in that index. Uh, and this is from the government that has no. double, double funding Order. to schools. Order. There is a question that was asked by Senator Mason. Senator Mason is entitled to hear the answer to the question. Senator Mason is also entitled to supplementary questions if he so chooses. Other additional comments from those other than Senator Mason should not be uh, intervening in the procedure of this uh, question time. Senator Mason. Supplementary question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the minister has indicated that schools will be compensated for the carbon tax through the indexation of federal funding, which is currently calculated, I understand, at around 6 per cent a year. How much does the government intend to increase school indexation to cover the cost of the carbon tax? Order. Order. The minister. The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. That's properly a question for the minister representing the Minister for Education. Uh, but given that the opposition seem only want to want to ask me questions, I'm happy to provide what information I can. What information I can? Uh, 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 yes, I uh, No, no, no. no uh, Knuckle Order. Draggers is, is Order. Senator Carr. He has a he has a trademark on that. So that's right, patent on that. Uh, but uh, I would make this point. I, I understand that. Uh, the AGSRC is calculated using the expenditure by state and territory government schools and is updated by the Ministerial Council, uh, whilst the main inclusions are for salaries and allowances for teachers and related on costs. The index also includes other recurrent costs, such as the cost of utilities. If you want further information, Senator, I suggest you ask the relevant minister. Uh, in relation to the broader issue of funding, this is the government that has doubled school funding, something that cannot be matched by the opposition, given their, their plan is to slash. Services such as health Time's and education. Senator Mason. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. Um, given the many sacrifices Australian parents already make to send their children to school, and the tireless effort that school communities go to, to raising funds for their schools, why is the government making it harder for schools, harder for students, and harder for parents by taking money out of the education system to pay for this toxic tax based on a lie? Order, order. The 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 minister. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this government has uh, been second to none when it comes to supporting education. Uh, and unlike those opposite, uh, where we have the leader of the opposition declaring war on the public school system, we have sought not to divide and not to play the politics of division when it comes to education. And if we want to talk about making it harder for parents and schools, those opposite voted against the school kids' bonus. Those opposite voted against the school kids' bonus. I'm asked 
about making things harder for schools and school communities. Those opposite have continued to criticise that building the education revolution, a massive investment in the, into the infrastructure for our children and for future generations. And those opposite, those opposite, I assume, are criticising this government for doubling school funding. For doubling school funding, if you want to ask a question about education, I suggest you get your own house in order. Your only policy, Senator, is to outsource it to Cameron. Time's Newman. expired. Everyone knows what that Time means. has expired. I order, order. I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of a parliamentary delegation from the National Assembly of the Seychelles, led by the Speaker, the Honourable Patrick Ermini. MP. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. Uh, with the concurrence of honourable senators, I would ask the Speaker to uh, take a seat on the floor of the Senate. Yeah. Sen Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Broadband, Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Can the Minister provide the Senate with advice on how other countries are addressing the need for broadband? How do they vary from the approach being pursued to build the national broadband network? Uh, the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Uh, merci, Monsieur President. Uh, vive la France. Uh, Mr. President, I thank the Senator for his question and for his interest in broadband policy. Mr. President, countries all around the world recognise economic importance of broadband infrastructure. But progress on delivering high-speed broadband, Mr President, is slow. It is slow in countries that are relying upon their incumbent telcos to deliver on these ambitions. And when Telstra had the monopoly on fixed-line infrastructure, they were slow to embrace broadband as well. Mr President, incumbent telcos favour fibre to the node. They do this not because it is efficient or effective, because it is cheap and preserves their market power. Mr President, Alcatel Lucent published five years ago a technology white paper that compared the cost of building fibre to the node versus going all the way to the home. Mr President, the member for Wentworth misuses this report and his discussions with BT to claim that his FTTN costs one third of fibre to the home. Well, Mr. President, that claim can only be made. Can only be made when an incumbent is building the network, the node network. But, Mr. President, that isn't Mr. Turnbull's plan. Last night on Late Line, Mr. Turnbull confirmed that he proposes that the government owned NBN Co will acquire the ageing, corroding copper network from Telstra with its $1 billion a year maintenance costs. Mr President, they're going to buy back the copper. Mr Turnbull should stop Time's misleading. Time's expired, Senator Conroy. Senator Br order, order. When this, when this silence will proceed. Order. Order. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the minister for his answer. I ask a supplementary: Is the minister aware of any alternative proposals for the Australian government to build, own, and operate a broadband network? The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the member for Wentworth said in an address to the Broadband World Forum in Paris. What a coincidence! In September last year, he must have been checking out some shares. I don't know. We will seek to achieve an outcome where fertilities-based competition is restored and enabled, not prohibited, and where the provision of network services is undertaken by the private sector, not the government. And the Leader of the Opposition joined him in this criticism, Mr President, telling the AIG National Forum in November, and I quote, the National Broadband Network is a great leap backwards to the 1960s, a government-controlled telecommunications monopoly. But, Mr President, last night Malcolm Mr Turnbull confirmed his plan for NBN to acquire Telstra's copper to build its network. So let there be no misunderstanding, Mr President. NBN Co, under Mr Turnbull, will be a government-owned monopoly. 
Senator Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. A further supplementary. Is the minister aware of any further details of the alternative policies? The minister. They're shocked. That's right. The minister. I've given uh, sorry, you the call. Mr. President. Mr. President, the member for Wentworth reportedly told the Australian Financial Review this week that he has a fully costed policy ready to go. Fully costed, ready to go. And you might ask, Mr. President, why on earth wouldn't Mr. Turnbull release it now? Why is he saying that it's going to be released closer to the election? Is it because it's taking him that long to explain it to Mr. Rabbit? Is it because he's having to explain what an upload speed and a download speed and a node is to Mr. Rabbit, the self-confessed I'm not Bill Gates? Because, Mr. President, Mr. Turnbull has zero credibility except in investment advice. And last night on Late Line, Mr. Mr. Turnbull advised us that French telecom shares were a good value. A good value. So get on board, Mr. President. French telecom shares are good value, according to Mr. Turnbull. But what he, what he went on to Time say. Time has expired, Senator Conroy. Order. Order. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, uh, Senator Wong. Uh, I refer the Minister to her answer to my question on Monday, uh, where she said that free permits uh, would reduce the cost impact of the carbon tax for the most emissions intensive uh, trade exposed industries. Can the Minister advise the Senate? Uh, how many of Australia's 42,500 plus exporting businesses uh, facing additional electricity price rises and other increases in their cost of doing business as a direct result of Labor's carbon tax will receive such free permits? The Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, certainly not as many as would have received a tax cut if those opposite hadn't said, indicated they'd vote with the Greens to oppose a tax cut. So let's let's remember let's remember those opposite. Uh, if they're interested in talking about tax policy when it comes to businesses, I will come to the question, Senator. Uh, if they're interested in if they're talking about order, order. You don't like the fact that I'm order. on my feet, do you? You don't like order. the fact that I'm on my feet. Order. Uh, uh, Senator Wong, your comments should be addressed to myself as the chair and not across the chamber. Senator Wong, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm simply making the point uh, that uh, there are a range of prices and taxes in the economy and that those opposite profess to care about business but, in fact, uh, were to combine with Bob Brown to vote down a tax cut for their constituency. Uh, in terms of the emission, what, is, what was the emissions intensive trade exposed uh, and now I think is the jobs and competitiveness uh, program, uh, those uh, permits are allocated on the basis of emissions intensity. Those, those permits are allocated on the, on the basis of emissions intensity. Uh, all of that is in the public arena. All of that is in the public arena. Order. 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 Senator Cormann. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise on a point of order. Uh, earlier this week, the minister asserted that free permits, free carbon permits, uh, would reduce the cost of the carbon tax impact on exporting businesses. I asked a very specific question. Uh, how many of the 42,500 plus exporting businesses will actually receive such free permits? There's only one answer that can be directly relevant to that question, and that is a number. Uh, either the minister knows what the number is or she doesn't. But there is nothing else that can be directly relevant to that question. I, ca I cannot instruct the minister how to answer the question. As a order, as I have said on numerous occasions, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer the question. You may well have an answer to the question fixed in your mind, but I cannot. I can, wait a minute. Previous, previous presidents have ruled consistently that they cannot instruct the minister how to answer the question. Now, I've been, order, I've been listening to the minister's, the minister's response. I believe the minister is answering the question, and the minister has one minute and two seconds remaining to address the question, and I call upon the minister to address the question. The minister. Mr. President. Uh, Senator uh, Betts. Oh. Mr. President, from time to time you have recourse 
to quoting rulings of former presidents. Former presidents never had the sessional order which required compliance to direct relevance. Therefore, with great respect yet again, Mr President, the coalition makes this plea to you that if the change sessional order, which we just confirmed again the other day, is, is, to, be, is to be implemented, then recourse to previous rulings clearly cannot apply to sessional orders that were not in existence at that time. Well, that was not uh, order. That was not relevant to what I just said. But um, I did order. I I had ruled. I had ruled that I. No, no. I had ruled that I cannot instruct the minister how to answer the question. That is consistent order, Senator. That is consistent with the way this chamber has been ruled over a long period of time. I am aware of the sessional order that you refer to, and I have drawn the minister's attention to the question and the fact that the minister does have one minute and two seconds remaining to answer the question. Order! 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 The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Perhaps uh, I could be of assistance by explaining how the program works, because. No. no well, Mr. President, the, the, the program works by, by way of. If I could Order. perhaps answer the question, Order. rather than just have. Order. Well, Interjections do not help. Order. 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 On both. Order. The Minister. Thank you. Uh, the, the program works uh, by establishing a baseline, uh, eligibility and baselines, uh, and those are worked through including by, by the Department with industry, including with the Independent Expert Advisory Panel. The issue then would be firms would need to apply uh, for eligibility under the program in accordance uh, with those established baselines and eligibility criteria. So I don't have a particular number within each sector uh, as to how many firms there are. I can give you an indication, for example. Order. Go on, Minister. You are going to continue to answer the question. Well, Senator, Mr. President, I don't think they're interested in the answer no, because no. they're continuing to interject. Minister. You've got four uh, seconds. Uh, what I can indicate uh, is that. Uh, oh. Oh, Order. Senator Brandis. Mr. President, the opposition has given this minister all the latitude in the world. As Senator Collins just pointed out in her interjection, there is only one second left in the answer. Nothing that. The only thing that the minister hasn't said but still has time to say in the remaining second of her answer is the only thing she was asked, the number of businesses to which these permits will issue. That's what she was asked, even if consistently with your ruling, everything else that she has said so far can be regarded as preamble or context. She can now only answer the question or admit she is ignorant of her own portfolio. Order. Order. The order. Senator Evans. President, on the point of order, it is of no uh, consequence whether Senator Brandis thinks he's given Senator Wong enough latitude. While his personal views are, of course, of interest, they have no relevance to how the Senate is conducted. I would point out in response to the. Uh, I would put out a response to the. Uh, Order. I'm glad to hear that's where you're getting your advice from, Senator. Uh, um, can I just say, Senator Wong actually answered the question, and perhaps the senators opposite didn't hear it because Senator Cormann, who asked the question, continually shouts across the chamber at Senator Wong as she tries to answer it. Therefore, he's probably not able to hear the answer. But, Mr. President, if the opposition is serious about wanting answers, they ought to listen. To the answer and not const constantly interject on the minister. Order. 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 There's, I still have one second remaining on the clock. Senator Cormann. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, given the finding by the TD Securities Melbourne Institute monthly inflation gauge 
that due to the introduction of the carbon tax from 1 July, the price of electricity rose by 14.9 per cent and gas and other fuel prices increased by 10.3 per cent. How many of Australia's two million small businesses facing those sorts of electricity price rises and other cost increases directly as a result of Labor's biggest carbon tax in the world here in Australia will receive free permits? The Minister. Mr. President, uh, as I uh, said earlier in my answer, which I appears they were so busy shouting, uh, Mr. President, they didn't hear. I'm not able to give the precise numbers of each firm within each industry. Order, order. The minister. Continue. I'm not able to give precise answers about how many businesses within each sector, within each industry. Uh, are, are eligible in terms of the criteria. Those criteria are public and they have been worked through through an independent advisory committee. I can give the opposition and the Senate an indication of the sorts of industries and activities uh, which have been uh, determined to be industry uh, emissions intensive trade exposed and they of course inc include aluminium, <coughs> steel, uh, glass, paper and a range of others. Uh, the number of firms conducting activities within each of those industries, uh, I don't have those figures with me, which I made clear in my first answer. Senator Cormann. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the Minister's uh, answer raises a question. Why is the Gillard government so intent to press ahead with the world's biggest carbon tax when it imposes an increased cost burden on 23 million Australians, which is five times higher than the overall cost burden imposed on more than 500 million people in Europe? Is the government really so out of touch to think that no amount of additional taxation in Australia uh, will have an impact on our economic fortunes and on our cost of living? The Minister. Well, with respect, Senator, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, I don't think there was a question in that. That was the same, the same rant, to be frank, Order. we've heard for two years. Uh, so I'm not sure how I can be directly relevant to a rant. I'm not sure how I can be directly relevant uh, to, to, a statement, to a statement that includes a number of untruths and a number of incorrect factual assertions. Uh, so if the opposition actually want to have a directly relevant debate, I'm very happy to have one, but why don't you start telling the truth? Why don't you start telling the truth and talking about the facts? But no, you'll keep going on about people that industries are being shut down, Wyala being wiped off the map, map and the sky falling in. Senator and Wong, no, Senator Wong, resume your seat. Order. Now, when we have silence, we'll proceed. Order. On both. Now, when there's silence on both sides, we'll proceed. Order, the minister. Well, Mr. President, as I said, uh, I went through yesterday for about the 50th time in this chamber the reason why the, uh, there are, uh, the, the assertion by the opposition about the imposition of this tax is incorrect. Yesterday, the Climate Commission uh, went through the number of Time's people, expired. the number of Time nations has expired. Will be Senator Milne. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, uh, Senator Wong. Uh, does the Minister recall in March this year the Treasurer, Mr. Swan, said that refunding mining companies for increases in state royalties would not change any of the mining tax revenue forecast in the first two years? Minister, given the Treasurer has now written to state governments threatening that the Commonwealth will implement measures to protect the revenue from recently announced or future royalty increases, can the minister confirm that the $13.4 billion expected revenue over the Ford estimates from the mining resource rent tax to the Commonwealth is under threat? The minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I have to say I, I anticipated this question from Senator Cormann, but uh, I thank uh, Senator Milne. Order. Order. <laughs> I have no response to that. Uh, Mr. President, uh, it is. Senator, Senator, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, just resume your seat. Thank you very much. Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator Milner is entitled to hear the answer. Senator, Senator Wong. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Well, first, uh, it is the case that the as. Order. 
ora Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it is the case, uh, as has been reported, that the uh, Treasurer has written to the State Treasurers on the issue of royalties to remind them of the government's position in relation to increases in royalties. Uh, as the Senate may or may not be aware, uh, the New South Wales government has announced it will increase uh, rates, and the uh, Queensland government is also indicating a royalty increase uh, is in the spotlight in its September budget. And, and Mr. President, if I could just uh, make this point, it would be interesting to see if the Queensland Liberal senators uh, advocate as strongly against that tax as they have as they have against the minerals tax, as they have against oh, and a, so, so a state liberal mining tax is fine, is it, Her Majesty? But a government, but a Commonwealth mining tax, a profits-based tax that delivers to Australians, that's bad. That's bad. I mean, this is an extraordinary proposition. Anyway, I'll return to the question from Senator Milne. I, I have previously indicated to Senator Milne. Uh, in relation to the minerals tax, uh, a number of points. The first is it is a volatile tax. It is obviously, as a profits-based tax, uh, movements in, in, in volumes, movements in prices uh, uh, obviously affect uh, uh, the, the tax take. Uh, the government is of the view uh, that uh, we do need to seek to resolve these issues with the states, which is why the government has written through the Order. Treasurer— Order. Senator Wong. Um, Senator Joyce. A point of order. Um, it's on the proper title. It's uh, Senator Brandis. Uh, Minister Wong continues to, re continues to um, throw uh, what is an acerbic con comment and one that we know full well that she's not capable of taking herself. So um, if, she can't, no. if she can't take it, she shouldn't order. throw it. It's Senator Brandis. Order. Order. I've Now, when, when their silence will proceed, simple as that. Order. I remind senators, I'm, I'm, Senator Collins is waiting to stand. Senator Collins. Oh dear. Order. Look, that, that, that just makes my point, Order. Mr. President. Order. Mr. President, maybe Senator Joyce can't hear the nature of some of the interjections up this end. But for him to be making that point absent what we all hear coming across the chamber from the other side, I think is ridiculous. Order. There's no point of order, but I do remind, as I did earlier, honourable senators need to refer to people in both this place and the other place by their correct titles. Um, the minister has nine seconds remaining to uh, answer the question asked by Senator Milne. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. As I previously indicated, uh, the uh, budget estimates were $13.4 billion. As the senator has indicated, that was a revision down in the first three years. Time has uh, and expired. Obviously we'll update Time's expired. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I take from the minister's answer that revenue over the Ford estimates uh, from this tax are under threat. Will the minister now admit? that the government made a mistake in its deal with the multinational mining companies in agreeing to credit unlimited royalties and that the government should have supported the Greens' amendment to limit the credit of royalties to those that were in place before 1 July 2011. The Minister. Uh, well, with respect to Senator Milne, I don't propose to traverse again uh, what occurred in the context of the passage of the MRRT. And, uh, uh, I think Order. Order. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, the, the arguments uh, for and against that amendment were, were traversed in that debate, and I'm sure the Senator is aware of them. Uh, the government's position is, as the, the Treasurer has articulated in his letter to the states, uh, and I would point out that the review, that is the independent GST review, uh, which is looking at a range of issues, including uh, this issue, uh, noted in its interim report that it was, and I quote, unrealistic for the states uh, to think they can, and I interpolate that, uh, capture the revenue stream generated by the Commonwealth's undertaking of a significant and challenging reform. And obviously that remains the government's position. Senator Milne. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the minister. But given the obvious need for increased government revenue to fund reforms such as Gonski Education, the uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme, and Denticare, will the government now agree that Australia needs the original Henry recommended resource super profits tax to bring in the increased revenue of $100 billion in the next 10 years? And will the government now revisit the super profits tax? Order. The minister. Uh, Mr President, uh, I'm sure Senator Milne will not be surprised that my answer is no. The government's made its position in relation to this very clear. The government, uh, as the Treasurer has indicated, uh, does have a view about uh, uh, resolving this issue with the, with the states, uh, uh, the issue uh, that uh, the, in, the independent review referred to in its interim report is obviously an issue that does need to be resolved, and uh, that is why the Treasurer has written. But the government uh, is not proposing uh, to agree with Senator Milne's proposition as put to me uh, in that question. Senator Nash. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Does the Minister agree with the Prime Minister's advice to Victorian fruit packing business Geoffrey Thompson Holdings, which has been hit with a one month carbon tax bill of over $10,000, a 15 per cent increase, that the business should simply pass on these additional costs to its customers in full? If the minister doesn't agree with the Prime Minister's proposition, will she at least concede it shows how dreadfully out of touch the government is with Australian agricultural businesses? The minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, well, first, I, I don't take uh, as read uh, the suggestion from the senator that the, the cost over a month is as a result of carbon is as she indicated. Um, it, it may be the case, but order, order. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the uh, the uh, order. <laughs> you know, you all three of you said it then, so you could at least do it one at a time. Order, um, <laughs> order. I know, I know. There's I remind echo. senators that interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Um, order. 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 The Minister. Thank you, Mr President. As we previously discussed in this place on a number of occasions, uh, there have been uh, substantial increases in electricity prices for some years. Uh, the vast majority of those have occurred as a result of investment in poles and wires, and the Prime Minister has indicated her intention to work through the COAG process uh, to try and ensure we see uh, a more efficient uh, way of, of dealing with uh, these network issues so that consumers are protected from the sorts of price increases we have seen over recent years. So, uh, on, that, on that front, uh, Order. Order. I would, I would, on, on that front, I would uh, certainly disagree with the uh, contention in the Senator's question. Uh, the Prime Minister is very well aware of the pressures that high electricity prices are causing, which is why she's indicated her intention to work through the COAG process to, to seek to deal with uh, the driver of the largest component of electricity cost increases, which is uh, infrastructure costs. In relation to agriculture, uh, I'd remind the Senator that, of course, agriculture is excluded from the carbon price mechanism. Uh, in relation to— Order. Senator, uh, resume your seat as Senator Nash is on her feet. Senator Nash. A point of order of rele relevance. The minister was specifically asked whether or not she agreed with the Prime Minister that the fruit packing business should pass on its additional costs caused by the carbon tax in full. The, uh, the, the question was broader than that. The minister is answering the question, and the minister does have 23 seconds still remaining to answer the question. The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In relation to the last bit, I was responding to a number of aspects of the question. If the senator only wants to ask one aspect, I'm quite happy not to take multi-barrelled questions, which give me the opportunity to talk about many things. But uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, impact uh, in terms of price increase. I think the point the Prime Minister was raising, making is that our household assistance package does assume costs pass through. Senator Nash. Thank you, Mr. President. Given that many agricultural businesses like Geoffrey Thompson Holdings supply major supermarkets, what will the government be doing to ensure the major supermarkets accept the passing on of the additional costs that the Prime Minister is advising? Order. 
the Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I think the Senator misunderstood my answer to the last question when she interjected that uh, this is not a household. The point I was making is that in the uh, assessment of what the price impact would be on households, the government did assume cost pass through. Uh, including, uh, including in, 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 in the food production sector. So the point is, we assume that uh, in terms of the amount uh, that we provided through increased pension, family tax benefits, uh, and uh, uh, and the tax cuts. Uh, in relation to the supermarket issue, I, I suspect uh, uh, through you, Mr. President, that actually is uh, the same question which was asked of me uh, a number of days ago. I can't recall if it was this week or not. Uh, in relation to the ACCC. I think it was, might have been Senator Xenophon from memory, uh, and I would refer the senator to my answer on that issue because that really deals with the same matter. Senator Nash. Thank you, Mr President. Given that businesses like Geoffrey Thompson Holdings have conceded that they, quote, may have to reduce their workforce to save costs, will the minister be apologising to those workers who will lose their jobs because of Labor's carbon tax? The minister. Oh, Mr. President, uh, if that, 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 is, that is yet another example of the sort of scare campaign that we've seen from those opposite. Uh, and uh, what I would remind those opposite of is this fact: that since we are we came to government, some 810,000 jobs have been created. 810,000 jobs being created. Uh, I would also remind uh, those opposite. Uh, that this government, whether it's through Senator Conroy and through the National Broadband Network, or whether it's through uh, the health, uh, the health portfolio, the education portfolio, is investing more in regional Australia than any government ever in Australia's history. And I know it is enormously embarrassing for Senator Nash that she could never deliver this sort of regional investment uh, when Peter Costello was treasurer. But the fact is, you never did. You never did. It's extremely embarrassing. But this Labor government has delivered more than you could ever get out of the Liberals. Order. Order. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Can the Minister please advise the Senate about Australia's efforts to combat the trade in illegally harvest timber and timber products? The order. Now, when, 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 there's, when there's silence, we'll proceed. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Stirl for his question. It is a trade that benefits criminals and has very serious environmental and economic impacts. A World Bank report estimates that every two seconds an area the size of a football field is harvested by illegal loggers. And if you use that estimate, by the time I finish answering this question, 600,000 square metres of timber will be illegally logged. The World Bank report, <laughs> and the World Bank report also makes it clear uh, that large-scale illegal logging operations are carried out by sophisticated criminal networks. So to, so to act to stop illegal logging is to act to stop organised crime. The illegal logging trade is a global problem costing around $60 billion each year. It directly threatens timber jobs here at home and in other countries by undercutting the price of legally logged timber. And knowing the facts about the evils of illegal logging, both sides of politics in 2010, the election campaign committed to combat it. Uh, there was bipartisan support to combat illegal logging. Uh, in fact, the coalition on the were on the record during the 2010 uh, election campaign saying illegal logging corrupts trade and leads to the destruction of the environment. Uh, the Gillard government has followed through on its commitment to take action against illegally logged timber, supporting the environment and supporting legal and sustainable forest jobs at home. The Gillard government has consulted uh, with importers, processors, retailers, employers' unions and environmental groups and we have continued to consult with our trading partners such as New Zealand, Malaysia, Indonesia and Canada to ensure that there is a system in place to combat illegally logged timber. Australia takes its international obligations seriously. At the Honolulu APEC Leaders Summit, 
all leaders undertook to work to implement time's expired, appropriate measures. Senator Ludwig, time's expired. Senator Stirl. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank the Minister for the answer. Can the Minister also advise of any recent progress that demonstrates that the Gillard government's efforts are delivering real partnerships with trading partners on the serious issue of illegal logging? Well, the Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Self for his first supplementary question. Uh, yesterday I had the opportunity of meeting with the New Zealand Associate Minister for Primary Industries, the Hon. Nathan Guy, to sign an arrangement to combat illegally logging and promote sustainable forest management. Australia and New Zealand share significant trade in timber products. In 2010-11, New Zealand was the largest export supplier of forest products to Australia, with trade of around $715 million. The Memorandum of Understanding will strengthen Australia's long-standing cooperation with New Zealand on forest product issues. Arrangements provide a framework for the ongoing bilateral cooperation against the illegal logging trade and its impact on jobs the economy and the environment. It will build the capacity of government and industry to manage forests sustainably and promote systems to verify the legality of timber and wood products uh, in Australia. New Zealand and the wider Asian Pacific region uh, together through the cooperation between Time's Australia expired. and New Zealand. Senator Ludwig, time's expired. Senator Stirl. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, can, uh, sorry, can the Minister inform the Senate of any obstacles to improve international cooperation in pursuit of commitments made by all APEC leaders to cooperate to prohibit the trade in illegally harvest timber and timber products? The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Searle for his second supplementary question. But just like a house of cards in the breeze, the Coalition's fear campaign are falling over on carbon price, on the economy and now on illegal logging. The fear campaign is in a shambles because those opposite, those opposite, uh, they they can't. They're in fact reduced to a husk of a party with no policies, no no promises for the nation, no plan. Taking action to crack down on illegal logging is good for the environment and good for Australian jobs, and of course, and rely legitimately on harvested timber from our trading partners. But right now, the Liberal National Party stands for illegal logging. And that means it stands for criminal networks gaining wealth from the proceeds of crime. Uh, whilst this government is taking action, those opposite, those opposite are opposed to combating illegal logging. Uh, and you might cry out in, in, in shame because you should be shamed. You won't support Senator the combating Lundry, of your illegal time logging. Has expired. Order. Senator Sinodinus. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Deregulation, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to the Prime Minister's speech on Monday night at the AIG annual national dinner. Isn't it a fact that of the 6.6 per cent decline in multi-factor productivity since 2004, 4.2 per cent of that has occurred since 2007? Why has this, decli why has this decline occurred under Labor? Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Order. Order. The, the minister. Order. 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 The Minister for Finance and Deregulation, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, yes, I, I am aware of the speech, and like Senator Sinodinos, I, I think we were both at that function. Uh, and uh, uh, there was, a, a, I thought, a very good uh, discussion in, in the context of that speech about the importance of getting the facts, the facts right on productivity. A, a very, a very good speech, if I may say. Uh, it, it is the case, Mr. President, that uh, you know we, we understand. I would hope on both sides of policy, certainly on this side, the importance of productivity. Uh, and it is uh, regrettable uh, that uh, um, uh, we saw under the Howard government a uh, decline in, in productivity growth over quite a number of years. Of course, uh, whilst you can't, as the Prime Minister said in a speech, whilst one can't read too much into uh, some of the shorter term figures, quarterly or annual figures, we, it is encouraging to see Australia's productivity growth having picked up over the past year. Uh, and uh, as, as the Prime Minister referred to, labour productivity growth in the market sector uh, has increased by about 2.3 per cent in the March quarter and 5.3 per cent over the past year. Now, I, I don't want to overstate that, Mr. President. As Senator Sinodinos would know, 
uh, productivity. By definition, one has to take a, a long, a long-run perspective. Uh, but uh, uh, those are pleasing results in terms of uh, uh, the last last year. Certainly, far more pleasing than we've seen uh, uh, in terms of the long-term decline in productivity growth, uh, uh, which started about a decade ago. Uh, the government's investments in productivity. The government's investments in productivity uh, include uh, our record investment in skills. Uh, we, and as the Senate might recall, we delivered some three billion dollars uh, in skill in the skills package. In the last budget, we've seen training places delivered, mentoring services delivered. We, we've, a key part of that uh, was the vocational education and training reforms, about a $1.75 billion package. In addition, the government is also making investments in critical infrastructure, and I'm happy to return to Time this. Time's expired, Senator Sinodinus. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, a supplementary. Um, given the government's commitment in 2007 to a one in, one out regulatory policy, why has it imposed over 18,000 new regulations associated with such measures as the carbon tax, the mining tax, the future financial advice, the Fair Work Act, on both business and the non-for-profit sector? Order. Order. The order. The order. The minister. Well, I'm very pleased to be asked that question because it gives me the opportunity to remind the senator that, in fact, this government is moving a, removing about a third of our regulatory stock, where provisions are either spent or otherwise redu redundant. Uh, there's legislation uh, that's currently before this place, which would remove up to 12— Senator, senator, senator Wong, uh, se Senators Conroy and Betts, I'm trying to listen to Senator Wong. If you want to have a discussion, wait till after question time. Order. Order, order, Senator Conroy. Senator Conroy, I'm endeavouring to listen to Senator Wong. Senator Wong, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, there is legislation before the chamber, uh, or certainly before the House of Representatives, to remove up to 12,000 pieces of redundant Commonwealth legislative instruments. Uh, I would also make the point uh, that it is this government. Uh, that finally is acting on the, on the recommendations with, of which the senator would be aware, that is, uh, in the Bell Review uh, and also subsequently in the Banks Review, uh, which is the harmonisation of occupational health and safety, uh, payroll tax harmonisation and, of course, also trades licensing. Uh, and the senator would be one of those opposite who would understand the importance of taking a national economic focus, and I'd encourage him to speak to some of the state Liberal governments who are standing in the way of these reforms. Senator Senator Dinas, thank, Senate thank, order. thank you, Mr. President. Further supplementary. Isn't it a fact that the overwhelming majority of the claimed over 12,000 legislative instruments that have or are scheduled to be repealed are being repealed because they're redundant and that will have no beneficial economic impact? Order. The Minister. Well, I, I, I wouldn't have thought that the senator would say it's a good thing to retain on the on the on the uh, legislative books uh, pieces of uh, legislative uh, legislation legislative, legislative instruments which are either redundant or unnecessary. And, and yes, uh, I am. I, I do think it's a good thing for the government to remove those, and we're doing that. Unlike unlike what occurred in those years under the Howard government. I'd also make the point in terms of productivity impact uh, that, the, as the senator would be aware, the Productivity Commission has analysed uh, the first tranche of the government's reform agenda when it comes to deregulation, uh, that is the seamless national economy reforms. Uh, and 17 of those, reform, of those reforms would lower business costs by about $4 billion each year when fully implemented, and improvements to productivity could increase GDP by around about $6 billion per year. I'm sure that the senator would be aware of those, and I again encourage him uh, to engage with the Liberal governments, uh, which are, are, are standing in the way of some of those reforms. Senator Madigan. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Conroy. Minister, in light of the fact that the Commonwealth's approval for the construction of the Bald Hills Wind Farm in the midst of a high conservation value bird sanctuary and wetlands area, home to 296 species of birds, 45 of which are listed in the Japan-Australia Migratory Agreement, 40 listed in the China-Australia Migratory Bird Agreement, and three listed in the Bonn Convention, means that Australia is now in just, breach just of wait, our— wait, wait a minute, Senator Madigan. There, there are a number of people on both my left and my right—order! Order! 
There are a number of people on both my left and my right. Order. 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 Senator Madigan is entitled to be heard in silence. Order. Senator Madigan means that Australia is now in breach of our international obligations to protect those birds, their environment and habitats as per the relevant articles in those agreements. Will the minister advise what actions are being taken to call in this project, remove Commonwealth approval and bring Australia into compliance with our international obligations? The minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Conroy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and could I thank Senator Madigan for his uh, his question? I do well remember, as uh, we've already heard from some of the interjections during the question, Mr. President, the passionate debate that this chamber had about the orange-bellied parrot. We had uh, that newly born greenie, Mr. Senator Ian Campbell, on behalf of those opposite, Mr. President, decided, Mr. President, he decided that this had to be saved at any costs. And all of those opposite joined with him in his passion to save the orange-bellied parrot. So let's have no interjections over there mocking Senator Campbell today. No interjections. Mr. No, look, I couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly uh, suggest that Senator Campbell— Senator Conroy, Sorry, Mr. President. I want you to address your comments to the chair. Ignore the interjections. Senator Madigan has asked a question which— you should be answering. And I, I did want to remind the chamber of uh, everybody's contribution on all sides on the orange-bellied parrot. But, Mr. President, the, the environment, uh, Mr. Minister Burke's environment department is closely monitoring this project to ensure that it is undertaken in a manner consistent with its conditions of approval under the Environment <laughs> Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, 1999. Responsibility, as everyone in this chamber knows who was involved in that debate, including Senator Brandis, who voted to protect orange-bellied parrots, responsibility for wind farm approval rests primarily with state and local governments. The Commonwealth is involved only where wind farm proposals impact on matters of national environmental significance. Mr. President. The matters of national environmental significance protected for this project are listed threatened species and communities and listed migratory species. Minister Burke is advised that in Time accordance— Time has expired. Senator Madigan. Mr President, as the conditions of approval agreed to by the Commonwealth in 2006 focus on locating and counting birds killed by the turbines and require the stopping of the turbines, and taking mitigation measures to prevent future kills if just three of the listed bird species are killed, what mitigation measures does the minister believe could realistically be taken to stop bird mortality by turbines located in the midst of a bird sanctuary, flyway and migration route, other than not building the wind farm? Order. The uh, minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Could I also indicate I didn't get a chance to at the end of uh, my answer to your previous question that any other matters in that earlier part of the question I happily take on notice and see if Minister Burke has anything further he would like to add. But, Mr. President, Minister Burke is advised that in accordance with the conditions of approval for this project, a bat and AV fauna management plan was approved for this project on the 17th of July 2012. <laughs> Under this plan, monitoring of avifauna is to be carried out and a report provided to the Environment Department in July 2013. And I'm happy to get a copy of that management plan and make sure that uh, it's available to you, Senator Manigan. But Minister Burke is advised that the approval also contains strict conditions relating to bird mortality. The person taking the action must notify Minister Burke in writing of any mortality of a member Time of a listed— Time has expired. Senator Madigan. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Considering that the research underpinning the Commonwealth's approval was so bad that the 2004 Victorian Assessment Panel found that, quote, at this stage there is insufficient information to allow proper assessment against the criteria of no impact on species listed under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act or the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act, unquote, on what basis has the Commonwealth continued to uphold its 2006 approval? The Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Again, I, I also I will take on notice any remaining parts of your questions I hadn't had a chance to address uh, there, uh, Senator Madigan, and see if Minister Burke would like to add to that. As I was saying, Mr. President, Minister Burke has advised that the approval also contains strict conditions. The person taking the action must notify Minister Burke in writing of any mortality of a member of a listed, threatened, or migratory species on the site of the action within 48 hours of becoming aware of the mortality. In the event of a second or subsequent mortality for certain species, such as the orange-bellied parrot, oh, the important. swift parrot, That's or the white-bellied sea eagle, all operations within one kilometre of the mort mortality site must cease immediately. And uh, Senator Madigan, you raised very valid questions. And I'm happy to take on notice any further parts of that question that I haven't addressed. But we should not forget that Senator, Senator Conroy, Ian Campbell Senator Conroy, gave your, us time, this your time's expired. S Senator, Senator Evans. Could I ask that further questions be placed on those paper, Mr. President? motions to take note of answers. Senator Joyce. Mr Deputy President, I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Wong to questions asked by all coalition senators. Um, Mr Deputy President, it's interesting having the minister who's supposed to represent the Labor left, who's supposed to be a person who can stand her ground, who's supposed to be part of the reason that um, uh, you would imagine that the Labor Party didn't take on um, what was obviously an eminently wise policy. That's the uh, immigration policy of John Howard, but um, since Minister Wong decided that John Howard's policy was the one that she wanted to support, and obviously all the uh, Labor left colleagues agreed with them, obviously led by Senator Evans, um, we now have to rely on that same strength of character, that strange, same commitment, that same, uh, that same stoic nature to be able to uh, guide us through uh, part and parcel of the introduction of the carbon tax. Now, it's going to be quite uh, perplexing as we see uh, bills come through at the moment. I was talking to uh, one farmer today, a substantial farmer from South Australia, from the minister's state, uh, who's going to have to pay approximately $35,800 this year for the carbon tax. Um, now, what on earth? I was trying to work out what I'd actually tell this farmer they're going to get for that. What, what do they get for that expenditure? What exactly do they get? Well, do they get, well, one turns on the television set, they might presume that they get Craig Thompson back, because maybe you get him for 35. I don't know. You'd be surprised what you can buy with that sort of money, but he knows the value of what you can buy on a credit card. But uh, maybe you could get that. Um, maybe you could get um, whatever we're seeing on the front page of the Australian at the moment. Maybe that's what you get. You know, with the AWU and the issues pertaining to that. Maybe that's what you get for the sort of money that is uh, uh, on offer uh, from the carbon tax. Uh, we have to realise that. What this is actually going to do is go to a very vulnerable section of um, the economy, uh, a section, especially in agriculture, that cannot pass on their costs. That cannot pass on their costs, right. and they will either have to absorb the costs by a lower standard of living or by putting people off. That's right. By putting people off, and if they're putting people off, I, I don't quite know how this is assisting regional Australia, who they tell us today that they have been the champions of regional Australia. One suspect that they are the champions for regional Australia in the same manner that uh, Minister Wong is the champion of the Labor left, and how she has failed so miserably in trying to look after the issues of the left wing of the Labor Party is how miserably they are looking after regional Australia. But they're great at the rhetoric. They're great at the rhetoric, but they're not so good at the delivery. 
Anyway, um, since the, the uh, Labor left is really a defunct organisation now, uh, has no real meaning, no purpose, no strength of conviction, no ability to stand on its own two pegs, seeing they are now pointless. Seeing that, I, I, but I congratulate Senator Stirl because Stirl is part of the right, and the right run the show. And, he's, and you are to be congratulated, Senator Stirl. You are to be congratulated for the way that you have rolled the Labor left backwards and forth, backwards and forth, backwards and forth, and shown what an absolutely pathetic organisation they have become. And it's good to see a new senator in here, a new senator who gave the maiden speech merely a couple of weeks ago, and it was great to listen to it as part of the Labor left. And in, with merely days, they've been rolled on one of their key policies, one of their key policies. And this is the sort of uh, conviction, this is the sort of stoic nature that, and Senator McLucas, there's another person from the Labor left who is absolutely rolled, absolutely rolled backwards and forth, complete, complete and utter doormat, to, complete and utter doormat to the right. But we must congratulate Senator Stirl to congratulate uh, Minister Conroy for rolling over Minister Wong, for rolling over Douglas, uh, Senator Douglas Cameron, for rolling over all the Labor left and make them look like complete and utter imbeciles without even a, 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 philosophically, a philosophical soul. But they will apparently be able to look after regional Australia. They will apparently be able to look after people with a carbon tax. They can't even look after themselves. They can't even stand up for themselves. How on earth could they stand up for anybody else? How on earth could they look after anybody else? Um, you know, but uh, in, in complete uh, hypocritical format, we've seen people such as such as Senator Evans, who told us that the greatest thing he ever did, the greatest thing, not one of the greatest things he's ever done, not amongst the greatest things he ever did, but the greatest thing he ever did was to wind back the Pacific solution. He's of the Labor left, you see, but he got rolled. He got rolled. He got rolled, and so what we have really now is a complete capitulation. Now, another person who's in the Labor left, who's uh, a reflection of the stoic nature, um, the absolute, uh, you know, iron, uh, the, the will of iron, uh, you know, the, the, the undoubted character. There's another person who's in the Labor left. His name is Prime Minister Julia Gillard. There's another person who has that will of iron, that insurmountable character, that can be totally relied on. But um, order. We, 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 we don't Senator quite know Joyce. anymore order. whether she's being rolled Joyce, or not, because we don't quite know expired. what she believes in. Order, we, Senator Joyce, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I rise also to take note uh, and participate in this uh, debate. And, and the first point I'd like to make is that the well-known and dominant principle uh, called the vomit principle is uh, is uh, apparent in this debate. Every single question time and at every single opportunity, uh, the opposition leader, the Honourable Tony Abbott and his disciples go on and repeat ad infinitum erroneous and non-factual positions in respect to the uh, carbon price. Uh, these positions, they believe that if they're repeated often enough, will become you know, part of the Australian public's understanding of the position. I think it's a fairly sobering position that Australia is the 15th largest polluter in the world and that we are the largest uh, polluter per person. And I think that there is a general community understanding that this is a position that needs something to be done about it. And, and basically, Mr. Mr Deputy President, at a number of the uh, Order. A number of the uh, climate change forums that I've participated in, where, where people have been invited to come along and make a contribution to this debate, uh, I can specifically recall one at the Norwood Town Hall, which I went to, I must admit, with a degree of trepidation, having listened to the, uh, uh, the position from the other side and been a recently elected uh, senator. But it was a reasonably well attended forum, and, and basically those people there were concerned that Australia was 15th in the world in terms of pollution and the largest polluter per person. And there wasn't any of the regurgitating of the uh, position put by this opposition. And one of the important contributions in that debate was a simple and clear presentation from a university lecturer of, uh, I think, from the uh, Adelaide University. And he gave a very dry economic uh, 
position, and he simply, he simply put his position was, if it's free to pollute, there is no incentive not to pollute. If there is a price on pollution, then you will change behaviour, and that is an economic principle which I think stands right across a number of areas, not only the carbon uh, emission debate. Now, I can actually go back, because I was a bit of a, uh, a spender, if, if you like, with my electricity. I wouldn't turn off lights when I moved from different parts of the house, and I quickly got re, uh, re educated by, uh, by the person in charge of the household. I can go back to a debate where we had an enterprise bargain negotiation in Alice Springs, where the, the airport manager actually insisted that everybody start being frugal with electricity in order to reduce their bills. And we laughed at him, but after a month of him taking solitary action, I might add, he came back and showed us the difference in the electricity bill. So I don't think there's anything wrong with a price on carbon which has the effect of changing behaviour in terms of using a scarce resource, an expensive resource. Now I think what's really apparent in this debate is the absurdities of the coalition. They failed to disclose that cost impacts are only a percentage of business turnover, that electricity is a percentage of business turnover, and it's uh, estimated that total electricity costs only represent 2 per cent of turnover. So to come in here with all of these examples of educational uh, institutions, hotels that are going to close their doors, lay people off, stop selling, stop educating, because a fraction of their business costs has gone up is quite erroneous. The, the other side of that equation simply is that there has been a compensation package which does allow people to justify, particularly small business, to justify the impact of any electric, electricity uh, increases and pass it on. I mean, there are proper tests and checks and balances in respect to that. But I mean that is a clear and unequivocal position, and the compensation package is widely understood to be in place for that event. So, in summary, a price on emissions will change behaviour. It'll change the behaviour of the big polluters. It'll change. It's changed my behaviour, and you know I may not be under the same pressure as an ordinary householder in respect to paying my electricity bill. But I have changed my behaviour in respect Order. to this matter. Senator Gallagher, your time has expired. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Note of given by Senator Wong to questions asked by all coalition senators. We've heard more denial from the government this afternoon about the impact of their carbon tax. It stands to reason that schools use a fair amount of electricity. Classrooms have to be lit, to be heated or cooled. There are computers and AV equipment in many of them. Of course, those school halls that the Prime Minister has built, whether or not the schools actually wanted them, all have electric equipment in them too. School canteens prepare hot food for students, all of which requires electricity. The July power bill of one large high school showed a carbon charge of almost $500 separately listed on an account totalling just $6,000. Now schools just can't cop that. The cost of a canteen lunch is going to have to go up. Shame on Labor, shame on the government. Once again, this government and this Prime Minister are asking us to trust them. They claim any increases will be offset by the indexation of federal funding. They want parents to trust them on that, and now they want parents to trust them on the Gonski review into school funding. This government is playing Australians for fools. It thinks it can get away with anything. The problem, though, that's now coming home to roost is that no one trusts this Prime Minister and no one trusts this shambolic, deceptive, incompetent government that she leads. Over the weekend, we saw a leaked list of 3,200 schools, Julia Gillard's hit list of schools that will have their funding cut. Hit lists aren't new to the Labor Party. Back in 2004, when Mark Latham was the new sensation and Julia Gillard his chief cheerleader, Labor had a hit list of schools targeted for funding cuts. They were proud of it. You won't often hear me praise Mark Latham, but at least he was honest about the fact that he was committed to cutting school funding. 
Julia Gillard says she has no plans to cut funding, just like she had no plans to challenge Kevin Rudd, just like she had no plans to alter the private health insurance rebate, just like she had no plans to introduce the world's biggest carbon tax. Yet on Monday, during an interview on Sky News, the Minister for Schools and Education, Minister Garrett, was asked to guarantee that no school would be worse off. He couldn't. So we have the Prime Minister running around telling us that everything is wonderful, that there'll be chicken in every pot, or perhaps I should say a sausage roll in every lunchbox. Everyone will be better off. On the same day, we have her own minister refusing to support her claims. So Labor's position, if we take everything that has been said in the last day, is that every school will be better off, but they can't guarantee that no school will be worse off. No wonder parents are confused. I'd like to turn for a moment to focus on schools across the great southern region of Western Australia, an area in which I take a great interest. I had a look at the hit list and was horrified to discover that some of those schools targeted for significant cuts are some of those most in need. There are many communities across the Great Southern that have been identified as being areas of high socio-economic need. They are proud communities and hard-working communities, but they are not necessarily wealthy communities. For instance, one of the schools on the hit list for, funding, for a funding reduction is the West Australian College of Agriculture at Narragin. Now, this is a school that is training the next generation of farmers. We all know that it's becoming harder to keep young people working on the land. Families that have farmed for generations are selling up because their kids don't want to carry on farming. For those that do choose to remain, we need to ensure their kids have the best education possible and the very best practical farming education there is so that they can run successful farms in the years to come. We're talking about people who will grow our food in the years ahead. Yet this government seems incapable of understanding that simple fact. The West Australian College of Agriculture at Narragin is slated to have its funding slashed by over $2.7 million. To take another example, the Gonski hit list proposes a funding cut of over $1.7 million for the Mount Barker Community College a school that services a catchment area with a significant Indigenous population and high levels of socio-economic disadvantage. There's many, many other schools on Labor's hit list. Cojanup District High School, Kentanig Senior High School, Southern Cross District High, Brookton District High, Newdigate Primary School. By my count, 41 schools across the Great Southern Region are on the hit list. None of them are wealthy schools. Many of them are government schools. This is more bad news for the Great Southern community and from a government that either doesn't understand rural and regional communities or simply doesn't care. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I sometimes think that on the issue of um, carbon pricing and how to deal with global warming, we have the most um, clear and striking contrast between the attitudes of the people opposite and the people on my side of this place. This very, very stark contrast. I'm glad to see that some of the flat earthers have been dragged, kicking and screaming into the 21st century, and even order on my left. Order. You have the call, Senator Thorpe. Thank Senator you. Wong, Thank you. You have the call, Senator Thorpe. I'm glad to see that even some of the flat earthers have been dragged, kicking and screaming, into the 21st century to actually recognise that global warming is a significant issue in our country, in fact, in the whole world. Where I live, where I live is, is a coastal region um, surrounded by areas like um, Clifton Beach, Sandford, Lauderdale. And work done by our local council, the Clarence City Council, has shown that the dangers of inundation on our coasts are very real and significant and particularly dangers coming from storm surges. So we are dealing with a very, very serious problem, and it's quite disconcerting to have it trivialised so much by those people opposite. At least the, um, the government is taking very sensible action in trying to do something about this serious threat. And we're not doing it by imposing a debt of $1,300 on every household in Australia to do it, and then handing that money over to the big polluters to spend as they will in some bizarre um, hope that, if given extra money, they'll cut their, their pollution. No, that's not how Labor is addressing it. Labor is addressing it by making sure that the big polluters have an incentive 
to change their behaviour, change their uh, reduce their carbon emissions by having a carbon price put on those emissions, a sensible and practical way to do it. And we're often, we're, it's often said by members opposite Mr Deputy President that Australia is the world, this is the world's biggest tax. In fact, Australia is in the middle of the pack in terms of global action on, on carbon pricing. And uh, something like uh, 90 countries, it's been found in the report International Action on Climate Change, 90 countries representing 90 per cent of the global economy have committed to reduce their carbon pollution and have policies in place to, reduce these, the, uh, to achieve these reductions. The Commission concludes that by next year, 850 million people will be living in countries or states with emissions trading schemes, including the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Sweden, Norway, New Zealand and Switzerland. Those people opposite should be praising this government for taking sensible action on this issue, rather than uh, being so negative. By being so negative. What this gives lie order to, if you wish order. to use the word lie, this gives lie, this gives lie to the claim by the opposition leader Tony Abbott that we are only going to achieve a significant reduction in emissions if there's global action. And at the moment there is no sign, no sign whatsoever that the rest of the world is going to do things like introduce carbon taxes or emissions trading schemes. If there is a lie, there is the lie. And what will the coalition's direct action policy take us to? It will destroy our international competitiveness. It will leave Australian businesses behind the rest of the world. It will make us the essential task of reducing um, emissions even more difficult and costly for us. And it will rip $1,000 out of the pockets of hardworking Australians, pensioners, students and families as you reduce— <laughs> We know. We know. I know. Order. I know. Order. But if the coalition get their way, it will be particularly painful for my state of Tasmania. 171,000 tax Tasmanian taxpayers may well lose their tax cut. 102,000 Tasmanians and 5,000 self-funded retirees will have money ripped out of their pockets if Tony Abbott rolls back the carbon pricing, and a couple on the full-age pension will have over $500 slashed from their pension under Mr Abbott's plan. And what's most concerning to me, Mr Deputy President, is this is a double whammy for Tasmania, a double whammy, because this is the same gov uh, the opposition that would, if in government, also rip $600 million per year from my state alone—$600 million per year. And I really wish the leader, the leader of the um, opposition in this place were here present, because I'm still waiting for a commitment from Mr Abetz that he will stand with his fellow Tasmanians, like yourself, Mr Deputy President, to make sure that that cruel fate doesn't come to our state. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator Ronaldson. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, Deputy President. I uh, rise to take uh, note of answers given uh, uh, by Senator Wong to, uh, uh, to coalition uh, senators. Uh, not actually the question I was hoping I was going to be speaking on, but nonetheless, I'm um, pleased to participate in this part of the uh, this part of the debate, and I uh, I, I would actually like to uh, I would actually like to uh, uh, to go back to uh, uh, Senator Gallagher who uh, spoke early on. I'm sorry he's not um, he's not here, but uh, if my memory uh, serves me, uh, Senator Gallagher and indeed uh, Senator Stirl uh, uh, made a big song and dance about uh, uh, the carbon tax on uh, on transport. If if, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, but what needs to be remembered is that the Australian Labor Party is re-elected, then in 2015, and there will indeed be a carbon tax on transport. Now, I didn't hear Senator Gallagher talk about that today, and I wonder why, Mr Deputy President. I wonder why, because he knows what effect the carbon tax on transport will have from 2015 on, and I would have hoped that he would have stood up today and defended his constituency looked after his constituency by viciously attacking the imposition of a carbon tax on transport. Because he knows what financial impact it will have on the sector. He knows what the potential employment impact will be. Now, I do want to, uh, I do want to talk about the, uh, uh, the greatest lie ever told in a deliberate attempt to mislead the Australian uh, people. And that, of course, was the uh, a statement by the Prime Minister prior to the last election uh, that there would be, uh, be no carbon tax under a government that she led. And now that indeed has proved to be 
a lie. And what uh, the opposition has said quite clearly is that we will untie this lie. And if we're elected, we will abolish the carbon tax. And I suspect I know what's going to happen after the next election if we win it in relation to the carbon tax. And those opposite, those opposite are going to be sitting on the side of the parliament which is voting for the abolition of that carbon tax. They will be across voting with us in relation to the carbon tax. So every single word the Minister Wong and the, and, the, and, the, and the Congo line of people standing up here on the other side talking about uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the bonuses and the uh, positive impact of a carbon tax will be thrown out in about the time it takes to count the vote after the division, which will no doubt be called uh, by their Greens, who no doubt will be uh, their, uh, their bed partners at that stage. I do want to, uh, uh, in the time left open to me, go back to a question asked by Senator Nash of Minister Wong. And I don't think anyone should underestimate the impact of the Prime Minister's comments in the last week on small business in this country. And when the Prime Minister said that small business or business should simply pass on additional cost to customers in full, she belled the cat on the impact of this tax on small business and on all Australians. It was an extraordinary statement from the Prime Minister of this country. It was a statement undoubtedly driven by the fact that she knows in her heart of heart what impact this tax will have on her. She knows full well that she told uh, the world's greatest lie in relation to the world's greatest carbon tax before the last election to buy off the vote of the Australian Greens. And we're now confronted with a tax which will do untold economic damage to this country, which the Australian Labor Party is going to vote to abolish anyway after the next election if we are elected. And I want to talk about the company uh, that Senator Nash referred to, Geoffrey Thompson Holdings, who have been hit with a one-month carbon tax bill of over $10,000, or 15 per cent, who cannot pass that on. And as, as Geoffrey Thompson Holdings said, and I quote, they may have to reduce their workforce to save costs. Another company approached me from central Victoria in the last 24 hours a food manufacturer, Mr Deputy President, who said they had been told by their supermarket supplier, or who, to whom they supply, that under no circumstances should they even contemplate passing on uh, their increased costs, because they simply would not be paid, and they'd go to another supplier who was prepared uh, to try and absorb the costs themselves. This will have an Order. extraordinary Senator damage Robinson, impact your time has on this expired. economy. Senator Milne, do you wish to speak on the same matter? Uh, no, not on the same matter. I'll just matter, put the motion you. first, and that is the motion moved by Senator Joyce to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Re President. I seek leave to uh, note the uh, answer of Senator Wong to a question that I asked in question time today uh, regarding the uh, mining resource re rent tax. And, uh, I rise today to speak about that because I uh, think it's a critical issue for Australia. Whenever you go in, around in the community, people say that they want the government to move to invest in our schools, for a start. Everybody recognises the inequality in school funding, that the bias of so many years has been away from public education towards private education. And schools have been extremely grateful, I might say, Mr Deputy President, for the injection of funds that occurred as a result of the stimulus package that the government and the Greens supported and the coalition didn't. And schools are very grateful for those new buildings. But nevertheless, schools are more than buildings. They require teachers and they require additional resources to be able to get better educational outcomes. And it is essential if in Australia we're going to move away from being a dig it up, cut it down and ship it away economy 
to one that invests in education, knowledge, training, commercialisation, more uh, diversification in the economy, then we have to invest in education. But to do that, we need money. If we want a national disability insurance scheme, we need money to be able to do that. Uh, if we are going to make sure we go to a universal dental access scheme uh, to match uh, a Medicare, then we need to have the money for it. That is the reality here is we are not raising enough revenue. And if you compare it, Mr Deputy President, with what happened under the Howard government, under the Howard government the tax to GDP ratio was such that if the same ratio applied now, we would have an extra $24 billion to be able to spend on education, on national disabilities, uh, on denticare. So let's not hear anything from the coalition about this, that the tax to GDP ratio would be delivering $24 billion more now if it was the same. But the government instead has got the MMRT, which was negotiated after the super profits tax failed the change of leadership in 2010. It was hurriedly designed by uh, the then Prime Minister um, Julia Gillard and current Prime Minister Julia Gillard, and that tax basically was on Extrata BHP uh, and uh, Rio Tinto. And the huge mistake, a gaping hole in that tax, was the fact that it enabled the states to in increase their royalties and the Commonwealth would reimburse that increase in royalties to the states. And if ever there was a green light to state governments to go ahead and increase their royalties, that was it. Now, when that legislation came through the parliament, with the opposition not wanting to raise money to spend on things like universal access to denticare, education, disabilities and the like, with the coalition refusing, the Greens put strongly to the government, we need to close that loophole. We do not want the mining trucks to be able to drive straight through that loophole and prevent the community from having the revenue it needs. The government has the revenue it needs to deliver for the community. So we said clearly, let's fix it. But the government voted against our amendment, and Minister Wong didn't acknowledge this in question time. And the only reason given at the time was we've done a deal with BHP, with Rio Tinto, with Extrata. We're not going to change that deal. We've done the deal. It's the deal. You either vote for the tax or you don't. And of course, the Greens wanted to actually raise the revenue. We would have preferred the super profits tax. We wanted to raise the revenue, so we voted for the bill. But we said at the time, this will come back to bite the government, and it has. The minister has now acknowledged that the revenue that was projected will not be raised. There is going to be a big hole, and now what is the government going to do about it? So we've heard Treasurer, uh, Treasurer Swan out there saying he's written to the states, proposing exactly what the Greens said in terms of capping, stopping any further reimbursement from the 1st of July 2011 in terms of the rate. But what the Greens are now going to do is introduce a private member's bill to give effect to the amendment that we moved then to get rid of this loophole. It is the most straightforward way of doing it. Messing around with GST is going to end up right in the midst of that report, and goodness only knows where that will end up. The cleanest, easiest way of fixing this so that the government has the revenue to deliver the programs that show we care about Australians and their ability to access education equally, their ability to have a national disability insurance scheme, their ability for universal access to denticare, then we need to raise the money and we need to fix this gaping hole that is out there in this tax that was hurriedly negotiated. We went straight to an election after that. We were busily negotiating something. There was a fundamental flaw in it. It's been recognised by everyone from Ken Henry to, and the Greens want to fix it, and we will. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Milne. The question is the motion moved by Senator Milne to take note of the answer given by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion?